Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Justin Meyer. I'm the Director of Development for the Department of Neurosurgery. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope that we find you all safe and well. This is your first time joining us for Fridays with Friedlander. We've covered many remarkable topics by incredible expert UPMC and University of Pittsburgh neurosurgeons. If you've missed any of our past presentations and would like to view them, please email me. I'll be posting my email address in the chat box. Feel free to send me any questions or comments you may have as well. All of our attendees' mics are muted, but you can type a question in the Q&A chat box, and we'll try to get to as many as we can in our allotted time. This week, this week, we're very delighted to highlight one of our extraordinary expert physician and faculty members of UPMC and the University of Pittsburgh Department of Neurosurgery, Dr. Stephanie Green. We're also very excited to have Allie, the mother of a patient that was operated on by and treated by Dr. Green, and we have our beautiful children here with us today as well. But first, I would like to welcome our Chair of Neurosurgery, Dr. Robert Friedlander, to give an update on the happenings from the last week. Dr. Friedlander, thank you, and please take it away. Uh, thank you, Justin. Uh, again, delighted uh, to be here today. You're really in for a treat uh, through this uh, episode uh, today. As we usually do, I'd like to provide an update on what's happened uh, the past week, uh, uh, pro provide an update on the COVID situation in our hospitals and introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Green. Uh, we've been uh, fortunate uh, throughout the whole uh, COVID uh, pandemic uh, that uh, the uh, Pittsburgh area, in particular, our hospitals really haven't been affected uh, at a very significant uh, amount. Uh, the numbers have uh, had uh, ups and downs, and luckily we're in a, uh, going down right now. The numbers are decreasing within our hospitals. As I've uh, uh, urged all of our uh, listeners is uh, to please not delay your care. Uh, if any issues uh, come up uh, within your uh, health care in general or any needs, obviously, from uh, our neurosurgical uh, point of view, please contact your doctors, your providers uh, to make sure that everything's being uh, watched and we don't want any undue issues uh, to happen uh, due to any uh, delays. And we've certainly uh, seen some. Uh, our hospitals are very safe. Uh, every The monitoring and the supervision is uh, really uh, terrific. Everybody has a questionnaire when they come in just to make sure there's no uh, exposures. Everybody has their temperature checked uh, uh, to come in. We're limiting the number of visitors in the hospital. Everybody in the hospital is wearing a mask and the hygiene in the hospital certainly uh, has uh, increased uh, to try to uh, prevent any transmission within our hospitals. So again, I urge anybody that has any needs uh, to make sure not to delay their care. Uh, furthermore, you know, we're happy to see as we have uh, people from other uh, areas that get monitored for us to, uh, to care. Now, one of the goals of our uh, department, uh, first and foremost, is to provide the very best care to each patient uh, at a time, one at a time. We know that for the doctors, we see many patients, but for each patient, it's their one life uh, or their families that, that we need to uh, take care of. So the number one priority is to do the very best we can with the care that we're providing. Now, in addition to that, that's something that every doctor and every department of uh, neurosurgery in general strives uh, to do. Uh, being a leading academic uh, department of uh, neurosurgery, not only in the country and the world, our goal is to advance the care so that every day we're able to take better and better care of our patients. Uh, uh, and in the past, when there are some things that uh, we really didn't have anything to offer our patients, is for us to innovate and push uh, things uh, forward and this is exactly what Dr. Green has been doing uh, in the topic that she will discuss uh, uh, today but really in her practice in uh, general. Uh, Dr. Green really is a remarkable individual and gifted uh, neurosurgeon, gives a, takes a amazing care uh, of her patients. She's the director of a vascular neurosurgery again blood vessel problems within the brain for pediatric, uh, the pediatric uh, population. She's also the director of the perineonatology neurosurgical uh, uh, service, which is, again, it's uh, what she will be talking about uh, today. She's also the, the site director for our residents uh, over at uh, our Pittsburgh uh, Children's uh, Hospital. So really, uh, she wears many, many uh, hats. Um, uh, in particular, I have uh, known Dr. Green from her training. She trained uh, uh, at the Brigham and Women's Hospital uh, where she did her uh, residency when I was uh, there, so I knew her uh, from uh, many uh, years ago, and she then went on to do a fellowship uh, in uh, Seattle. So we're really uh, incredibly fortunate to have her uh, within our faculty, and you'll really enjoy today's uh, presentation. So Dr. Green, uh, please go ahead and take it away. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Friedlander. I'm honored to be here today. And uh, thank you everybody that's tuning in for listening to the presentation. I also want to send a special thank you to Allie Mullen and her children who were kind enough to join us. I know it's not easy to corral a couple of children for a half an hour presentation, so I hope uh, they're cooperating for you. Uh, today, I'd like to discuss the application of fetal neurosurgery to spina bifida. As an overview, I thought we'd start with the discussion of spina bifida itself, um, then talk about postnatal closure and outcomes we see with that, and then talk about the evolution to prenatal closure and finish with the discussion of Ali's case. So spina bifida means that there is an opening in the spine. So there are a variety of conditions that fall under the diagnosis of spina bifida. It includes myelomeningocele when the spinal cord and nerve roots are extruded through the spine. It includes meningocele, which is just a sac of cerebrospinal fluid outside of the spine. Um, it includes spina bifida occulta, which is just a bony defect. Open neural tube defects are not covered by skin. That includes myelomeningocele and meningocele. In the head, it includes a condition called anencephaly. And 20% of spina bifida cases are closed. This is really a different embryologic process. And that includes lipomyelomeningocele, phylum terminale, lipoma, uh, and others. We're going to be talking today about myelomeningocele, which is the condition that is treated prenatally. Embryologically, the spinal cord starts out as a flat plate called the neural plate, and it forms a tube called the neural tube, um, which ultimately ends up as the brain and spinal cord. The bottom end of the tube closes at 26 to 28 days gestation. If that closure does not happen, then a fetus develops a myelomeningocele. Unfortunately, 26 to 28 days gestation is often before many women know that they're pregnant, so they're not likely to be taking prenatal vitamins and doing other things to optimize the health of their pregnancy. The prevalence of myelomeningocele is variable world worldwide. It varies by ethnicity. It varies by diet. Um, in the United States, it occurs at about five per 10,000 births. Genetic factors that um, are incompletely understood are evidenced by the fact that myelomeningocele is more common among twins. If a woman has one baby with a myelomeningocele, her next pregnancy is 10 times as likely to be affected by myelomeningocele. Environmental factors include a maternal diabetes, gestational or pregestational diabetes, uh, as well as the use of anti-epileptic drugs. An important factor that is modifiable is the use of folic acid. Folic acid is, um, uh, doses of folic acid are elevated in prenatal vitamins to try to prevent neural tube defects. And it's now being supplemented in uh, grains and bread and flour in an attempt to get it into the diet. 50% of pregnancies in the United States are unplanned. So women with unplanned pregnancies are unlikely to be taking folic acid. And so the risk of myelomeningocele is elevated in these people. I should warn you that I'm going to be showing some photographs of myelomeningocele defects like you see here, as well as some operative photographs. And they could be disturbing to some viewers. Typically, a myelomeningocele is identified on a routine, what's called an anatomy scan, or an ultrasound that an obstetrician performs at about 20 weeks gestation. This is an ultrasound showing the spine here and a little sac down at the bottom. That's the myelomeningocele defect. So women usually discover this about halfway through pregnancy. The defects can look um, very, uh, vastly different from each other. They can be small and flat, like this one. They can have the spinal cord uh, visible out on the surface of the defect, like this one. Uh, the defect can be beneath a large sac of fluid. They can be partially skin covered or not skin covered at all. Uh, when a child is born with a myelomeningocele, it's closed within 48 hours of delivery in order to minimize the chances of infection. 
Um, what we do in the operating room is we separate the skin from the tissues surrounding the spinal cord. The untubularized spinal cord is called the neuroplacode. We close the dura, which is the layer of tissue that separates the spinal cord and cerebrospinal fluid from the surrounding bone, muscle, and skin. We perform multiple layers of soft tissue closure to try to provide some protection to the spinal cord. And we close the skin. We consider placing an external ventricular drain, which drains cerebrospinal fluid from the head out to a bag next to the bed in order to minimize the chances of cerebrospinal fluid leak in this postoperative period. The surgery takes about two to three hours, including anesthesia, um, breathing tube going in, IVs, and waking up afterwards. Uh, the baby arrives to Children's Hospital to the neonatal intensive care unit and returns there postoperatively. The average hospitalization is about eight days. Um, the baby cannot lie on their back for six weeks after surgery because the skin is so tenuous. What you see on the right hand side of the screen here is a myelomeningocele defect. Uh, so basically we take this round defect and we turn it into a straight line with the closure. This closure has a skin glue on top of it so it looks a little bit shiny, but I think you can see the incision beneath. Hydrocephalus is a condition we see commonly with spina bifida. About 60 to 90 percent of children who have their spina bifida defect closed postoperatively require placement of a ventricular peritoneal shunt. About 20 percent need that placed either at the time of their myelomeningocele closure or within a week thereafter. Hydrocephalus is the buildup of cerebrospinal fluid um, beyond what the body can absorb. I have two uh, postnatal ultrasounds here. On the left, you see an ultrasound of a baby with hydrocephalus. These black areas are the ventricles that are dilated. And on the right, you see a normal postnatal ultrasound in an infant. And for hydrocephalus is placement of a ventricular peritoneal shunt. That involves a tube that's placed into the ventricle in the head, runs under the skin to a valve that regulates drainage, and then runs under the skin down to the abdomen. The peritoneum is the sac that holds all of the abdominal organs inside of it, and the tube terminates there. The peritoneum secretes a fluid called peritoneal fluid that is very similar to cerebrospinal fluid in consistency, and so it readily absorbs cerebrospinal fluid. Children with myelomeningocele um, all pretty much have a radiographic Chiari 2 malformation. Chiari 2 malformation is the herniation of the lower brainstem and part of the cerebellum down into the space that should include only the spinal cord. About a third of patients develop symptoms of this by the age of five, and the only treatment for these symptoms is surgical. The uh, bone of the spine is opened, the dura is opened, the drainage pathway of cerebrospinal fluid out between brainstem and cerebellum is opened and the dura is patched to allow more space for the brainstem and cerebellum. Um, this is often effective, but about a third of patients do not improve after Chiari 2 decompression. Um, about 3% of children with myelomeningocele die in the first year of life and a significant percentage of these die from their Chiari 2 malformation. Typically, these are children with respiratory failure. They're born with severe hydrocephalus. They have symptoms shortly after birth. Uh, central apnea is a, um, a condition that portends a worse prognosis for these children. Autopsy studies on some of these children have shown that the brainstem is disorganized. That would imply that a surgical decompression wouldn't have been expected to improve the symptoms. We don't know which patients have a disorganized brainstem and which patients will improve with surgeries, so we operate on all patients in hopes that they will improve. All symptomatic patients. Tethered cord syndrome is a condition that affects children with spina bifida later in life. This is a constellation of symptoms that includes pain in the back or the legs, sensory changes or weakness in the legs, um, children can have a rapidly increasing scoliotic deformity or their incontinence can worsen. The condition often presents during a growth spurt or a period of intense exercise. 
Um, the spinal cord is separated from the dura where it has scarred um, around the time of birth. And this will improve um, symptoms in about two thirds of patients. The symptom most likely to improve is urinary incontinence. Uh, the symptom least likely to improve is pain. The best surgical outcomes are obtained in young children and in those who've had symptoms for just a short duration of time. The prognosis for spina bifida is different from the average child. 75% have normal intelligence, which is a decrease. Uh, by the normal bell curve, 95% of children fall in the normal intelligence range. Uh, up to 50% of children with spina bifida have latex allergies. This was initially thought to be related to latex exposure because of multiple surgeries. Um, but the incidence of latex allergy hasn't changed as um, hospitals have shifted to latex-free environment. It's now known that these children have um, a genetic predisposition to latex allergy. 75% of children uh, with myelomeningocele can ambulate uh, with assistive devices or without. The number of children that can ambulate declines with age. The most common cause of a loss of the ability to ambulate is tethered cord syndrome. About 20% of children, or one in five, require spinal cord detethering during childhood. So those numbers are not overwhelmingly positive. Um, physicians were looking for ways to improve outcomes in myelomeningocele. Obstetricians were in particular frustrated because leg movement that they could see early on in pregnancy vanished by the end of pregnancy and was not seen after delivery. So a two-hit hypothesis was formulated. Um, the idea was that following the failure of closure of the neural tube, there was ongoing injury as the pregnancy progressed. Perhaps the amniotic fluid was toxic to the developing nervous system. Um, and the postulate was that in utero closure of the myelomeningocele defect could preserve the neurologic function that was seen early in pregnancy. Case reports published in the 1990s demonstrated that it was possible to perform fetal surgery for myelomeningocele, but the results were mixed. The technology was not where it needed to be to bring these patients to term delivery. Uh, amniocentesis was not reliable. Fetal MRI didn't exist, so other anomalies were that were present in these infants were not recognized prenatally. This was not good enough evidence for anybody to adopt this as their standard practice. The management of myelomeningocele study was funded by the NIH for the years 2003 to 2010. This was a randomized controlled clinical trial. During the trial, pediatric neurosurgeons agreed to a moratorium on fetal neurosurgery for myelomeningocele outside of the trial in order to maximize participation in the trial. The goal was to randomize 100 women to prenatal and 100 to postnatal repair of their infant's myelomeningocele defect. There were many inclusion criteria, many exclusion criteria, and enrollment was slow. About 10% of people declined the study after touring the neonatal, neonatal intensive care unit and discovering what a premature infant looked like. Recruitment was ultimately halted after 103 subjects were enrolled because of a clear benefit. These are some images from the publication about the MOMS trial. The prenatal closure was performed between 19 and 26 weeks gestation. Uh, what was performed was a laparotomy and a hysterotomy by the obstetrician or maternal fetal medicine surgeon who positioned the infant's myelomeningocele defect within the hysterotomy so that the neurosurgeon could see it. The neurosurgeon then performed a closure very similar to postnatal closure, uh, but on a much smaller infant. Irrigation needed to be pumped into the uterus continuously during the procedure to prevent the collapse of the umbilical cord and instability of the fetus. The uh, myelomeningocele defect was separated from the skin. The dura was closed. The skin was closed. The uterus was closed. And the abdominal wall was closed. 
the risks to the mother were the standard risks of a cesarean section that was medically unnecessary for her. Uh, importantly, this healing incision was subjected to ongoing pregnancy. A pregnant woman that is involved in a car accident often will deliver the fetus. This woman undergoes an intentional incision into the uterus and it is then asked to continue the pregnancy. This requires a lot of effort uh, from her material, maternal fetal medicine surgeon in order to continue the pregnancy. The risks to the infant, besides the major surgery, are the risks of preterm delivery. The average infant in the myelomeningocele study was delivered at 34 weeks gestation, six weeks premature. The study was published in March of 2011 in the New England Journal of Medicine. This is one of the rare randomized controlled trials in pediatric neurosurgery. They published infant outcomes at 12 months. The rate of placement of a shunt was 40% in the prenatal group as compared to 82% in the postnatal group. The incidence of Chiari 2 malformation was dramatically reduced on imaging. 64% as compared to 96% in the, in the postnatal surgery group. It remains unknown whether the need for Chiari 2 decompression is unchanged. That data has not yet been published. Um, the appearance of Chiari 2 malformation uh, improvement would suggest that those patients were less likely to require a Chiari 2 decompression. But we know about this subset of, of patients with malformed brain stems. A brain stem malformation would not really be expected to improve by the elevation of those structures into the skull. So that's a question that remains. Uh, at the bottom of the screen, you'll see that surgery for a tethered cord in the first year of life was eightfold higher in the prenatal surgery group than the postnatal surgery group. Outcomes at 30 months showed improvement in several developmental scales. Additionally, the number of patients whose neurologic function was one or two levels better than expected was 43% as compared to 20% in the postnatal group. It should be noted, however, that 57% of patients were no better than expected or worse. Although that number is lower than the postnatal surgery group, these women and infants have undergone a significant surgery for no improvement in motor function, although they may have an improvement in shunting. The number of patients able to ambulate independently was doubled in the prenatal surgery group as compared to the postnatal surgery group. These data looked very promising to our group here at UPMC, and we thought that this was a procedure that we'd like to offer to women. So we formulated a team that included myself uh, from pediatric neurosurgery, Dr. Emery from maternal fetal medicine. We had OB cardiology, OB anesthesiology. We had a surgical team for the maternal fetal medicine surgeons, a pediatric neurosurgery surgical team. We had neonatology on standby. Um, and then we waited for our perfect first patient. We screened about 60 people before we found Allie. She was a 27-year-old woman pregnant with her second and importantly last child. Uh, women that undergo fetal surgery have to have cesarean sections for both that pregnancy and any subsequent pregnancy. She was uh, exactly 20 weeks along in her pregnancy, so we had a few weeks for planning. She had a myelomeningocele defect that it was at the right level. The lumbar levels are the levels at which we can make a significant difference in patients with myelomeningocele. A thoracic myelomeningocele patient doesn't walk. A patient with a sacral myelomeningocele doesn't have enough damage to see an improvement if we do surgery on these patients. So her defect, or her infant's defect at L4 or 5 uh, was a perfect candidate. Allie was a PICU nurse at Children's. So she knew myelomeningocele. She had taken care of these patients. 
she lived in Pittsburgh, so it was or the Pittsburgh area anyway, so it was easy for her to get back and forth for appointments. And she knew she was the first and she was um, happy to be the first and she put her trust in us. Uh, this is just a couple of pictures to show you how crowded the operating room was on the day of her surgery. This is Dr. Emery performing the cesarean section, exposing the uterus. This is his uh, assistant. This is our OB cardiologist and the scrub tech in the background. Here's an image of myself and my assistant closing the myelomeningocele defect. I think that's Dr. Emery in the background there. This is our OB cardiologist, our scrub tech, our circulating nurse. Dr. Emery had a maternal fetal medicine specialist from another institution on telemedicine with him in case any issues came up during the case. This is an image of what we could see under the microscope, just so you can see how magnified everything is. This is the myelomeningocele defect. So you see how small that is compared to uh, the pictures I showed you of the postnatal myelomeningoceles. I'm not gonna show you the video. Uh, Postoperatively, Allie was in the hospital for four days, uh, standard for C-section, standard for what was done in the mom's trial. She underwent serial ultrasounds that demonstrated normalization of the anatomy uh, in her baby's brain. The um, skull of an infant with a myelomeningocele is described as, they call it a lemon sign. It's kind of lemon shaped. You can see that her infant skull became more rounder and typically shaped as time went on. The cerebellum is described as having a banana shape. You see that here and you see that resolving in the subsequent ultrasounds. Um, I didn't have a good picture of this, but the Chiari 2 malformation that we saw uh, early in pregnancy resolved before uh, delivery. Her ventricular size also uh, decreased to the normal range. Um, and Allie's baby was delivered by cesarean section at 34 weeks gestation. On the left, you see a picture of a standard myelomeningocele closure after birth uh, at one year of age. And on the right, you see Allie's baby's incision on the first day after birth. So she still has a scar, uh, but it's much subtler than what you see with the routine postnatal closure. So here's a picture of Dr. Emery, myself, and Allie with her baby. Uh, she and her husband decided to name their baby after Dr. Emery and me, which I am I'm still so touched by. Uh, she, uh, baby Emery has full motor function with the exception of some weakness with the ability to point her toes down. Uh, she has no hydrocephalus, she has not required a shunt, and she does not have a Chiari 2 malformation. This is a recent picture of her, and Allie shared with me a couple of those and a video of her walking. So she's uh, 17 months old now. This is a relatively recent video. So in summary, um, spina bifida is a potentially devastating disease. Um, but fetal surgery is a promising treatment that suggests that it improves outcomes on several fronts in some, but not all patients. The risks and benefits of this prenatal surgery are complicated and need to be complicated for each patient, uh, need to be calculated for each patient individually. The prenatal surgery does not cure the condition, but it, it does ameliorate it in the majority of patients. Many patients don't meet the extensive criteria necessary for safe prenatal closure. Fetoscopic repair may be a future option. The complication risk, uh, risk of complications to the mother are lower and the mother is not required to have a cesarean section for that or subsequent pregnancies. Uh, but the quality of the myelomeningocele repair with current technology is still much poorer. So it's, um, it's not an option we're pursuing at this time. Uh, that's all I have for you today. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I would be happy to answer any questions.
Thank you, Dr. Green. What an incredible presentation. We're very honored uh, to have you with us at UPMC and the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, we're going to begin with the Q&A portion of our presentation. We will try to answer as many as we can in our allotted time. Um, Ali, would you like to say a couple words before we uh, throw it back to Dr. Freelander? My Emory is not quite cooperating today. <laughs> Um, can you guys hear me with my mute? We can't. You're yeah. good, Allie. You're, okay. you're great. Um, yeah, I guess with all this that went on, we made the best decision that we've been able to make for her. Um, she is very close to walking. Unfortunately, she's stubborn like her mother. So when we are ready to let go, she crumbles herself to the floor. But, um, going through the process of all of this it was um in the beginning it was very tough but i the knowledge that dr emory and dr green brought to us um and the opportunity that they also presented to us as well was um probably one of the greatest things we could have done for emory she is just doing awesome um today she is talking, she claps, she waves, she's walking um, with a little bit of assistance. Hopefully soon she'll be walking by herself if she gets out of her stubbornness. Um, but we've also been able to avoid hydrocephalus, which is very nice um, because of the amount of surgeries that that entails um, in the beginning, then also as the kids get older. Um, but I mean, I'm just very thankful for Dr. Emery and Dr. Green. They have just done wonderful with them. And then following um, us as well with, um, we go and see Dr. Uh, Green very often, um, as well as her PA, and they just are awesome. They, I, I'm very thankful for them. Thank you so much, Allie. We appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Green, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Freelander, would you like to say a few words before we begin our Q&A? Sure. Uh, well, what a what a wonderful uh, story and saga, I would say uh, it is. And you know, this is uh, you know many all all physicians uh, go into medicine as well as uh, you know nurses and everybody is to uh, make people better. And a lot of time we deal with a very severe uh, illnesses, but really to once we make people better and we see a smile, just uh, <laughs> I'm not going to say makes our day, makes our makes our uh, you know, our, our life in terms of why we went into uh, into medicine. And one of the things that uh, we have through this uh, Teams uh, format presentation, I could see the face of uh, everybody. And I could see Allie's face when she saw her own daughter walking on the video. Obviously, she sees her, wa her daughter walking in reality. And just seeing her smile was so amazing. I, uh, I'm not going to say, uh, I almost started crying. I mean, it, it's, just, it's just really, really uh, cool to be able uh, to see uh, the the impact that uh, that Dr. Green has had uh, on on this uh, one life, and obviously one life impacts uh, all the other ones. So really, congratulations! Uh, thanks, uh, Ali, for uh, being uh, available uh, uh, for for this and for uh, one uh, deciding to go forward with this. I I can only imagine how difficult of a decision is, particularly since you saw what uh, what kids and family uh, go through. Uh, but it's a uh, really a, a fantastic uh, uh, story and we look uh, for for many um, more. Again, I'm just incredibly proud for what Dr. Green uh, has done and continues uh, uh, to do. And uh, you know, we look forward to uh, uh, your uh, Q&A uh, session. So thank you both for being here. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Dr. Friedlander. I agree with you. What a moving Present, or video and, and presentation from uh, Dr. Green. Thank you all. Uh, Dr. Green, we have a number of questions. Um, uh, what should parents look for in a pediatric neurosurgery program when seeking care for their children? Oh, um, gosh, I think what's important is that the program has at least one person that has expertise in their child's condition. Um, we have one of the biggest spina bifida programs in the country here. 
So we're fortunate to have uh, a large population and a large experience with that. Um, but conditions don't appear in the same frequency all over the country. So it's important to, to have a doctor that you trust, um, that you get along with well, and that knows your child's condition inside and out. Great, thank you. At what point in your career did you know uh, that you wanted to be at practice pediatric neurosurgery and not adult neurosurgery? Um, for me, that was a fairly late decision. I knew I liked kids, but you can see kids everywhere. You don't have to operate on kids. Um, the reason I went into pediatric neurosurgery was that I wanted to teach and I wanted to operate on all sorts of different conditions. As you see, I do the vascular neurosurgery at Children's. I do the spina bifida surgery at Children's. Um, I do a wide variety of surgeries, tumors, hydrocephalus, Chiari malformations, uh, spinal fusions. And it's hard to have a career in academics on the adult side without subspecializing and giving up a large percentage of these patients. There are other things that are great about pediatric neurosurgery, like um, children just tell you how they feel. If they're doing well, you know it. And if they're not doing well, you know it. They want to get better more than anybody. And, um, and their bodies bounce back a lot better than adults, so it's easier for them to get better than it is for adult patients. So I would say those are the big reasons. Great, thank you. Uh, how do you avoid burnout with such a demanding career? Um, I think having outlets for stress are important. Um, I have my own family, which is a real respite from the hospital. Um, I think exercise helps. I think good nutrition and sleep help. Um, and I think loving what you do helps a lot. These kids that are so happy to see you um, rejuvenate you and keep you going. Okay. Do you partner with neurosurgeons who mainly treat adults? on your cases? There are some cases, um, uh, children have conditions sometimes that are more common in adults. Um, and so we will do surgery together with adult neurosurgeons for certain conditions. Spina bifida is one that is really primarily treated in pediatric neurosurgery. So we don't partner with adult neurosurgeons for that one, but there are other special kinds of tumors, et cetera, that we, that we do work together with the adult neurosurgeons. Okay. Uh, what are some of the most exciting surgery techniques and research taking place in your area right now? Um, I may be a little bit biased, but I, I think um, we're trying to expand fetal neurosurgery for other conditions. So um, we have some ongoing research in Pittsburgh where we're looking at um, developing a technique to treat hydrocephalus in utero. And there are several other places in the country that are working on that sort of thing as well to try to advance uh, fetal neurosurgery. Okay. Uh, what is the average age of your patients? Uh, well, we treat patients from birth up till age 22. So age-wise, I guess the average is 11. Um, in terms of the um, frequency with which we treat patients, I think we see more patients on the younger side of the spectrum, so maybe average is around age seven or eight. Okay. Uh, can you talk about the challenge of having two patients at once when you're performing prenatal neurosurgery? Uh, yes, that, that is a challenge. I think the um, the important thing is to have a big team of experts. Um, I was not focused on Allie during her surgery. Dr. Emery was in charge of Allie. I was focused on baby Emery. And we were each taking care of our part. Um, we did a walkthrough a week before. So we had Dr. Emery standing up at the table and he was saying, okay, I'm going to be exposing the uterus now. And then I brought in the microscope and I said, and now I'll be closing the myelomeningocele defect. And we had all the different uh, people that would be present for each part of the surgery um, comfortable with what their role was and when they should step forward and when they should step back. There's only so much space around that table. Yeah, sure. Uh, what do you want your patients and families to know about you? Interesting question. Oh. <laughs> Um, what do I want them to know about me? Um, I 
love what I do. I research each patient as completely as I can. Um, I am a planner, so I've got a lot of uh, details that I like to take care of in advance. I like to say that luck favors the prepared. So, so we like to plan for every eventuality and hopefully we don't need to use all those plans that we have in place, but I'll, I do my best for every patient. That's great. Allie, question for you. How do your uh, kids get along? Interesting <laughs> question for you. <laughs> Uh, my girls, Anderson, Emery, they get along very well. We have our fights here and there. Uh, it's usually over a toy, or recently it's been Barbies, the Elsa Barbie. <laughs> but, um, my girls get along very well. Aniston is a, she's a very good big sister to Emery. She um, likes to hold her other hand and help her walk, um, and she does a very good job of taking care of her. That's wonderful. Uh, Dr. Green, what do you like most about practice, practicing at UPMC? Um, I think what I like most about UPMC is that it's a really forward-thinking institution. They want us to be at the forefront of medicine and um, they're not afraid to put their money where their mouth is. When Dr. Emery and I wanted to travel across the country to attend this course on fetal surgery, um, it costs a lot of money. And UPMC said, makes sense, okay. There was no argument at all. They just paid for us to go. They they wanted us to be able to provide this for patients because they saw the potential. And, um, and that's a great place to work, a place that gives you fulfillment and lets you push medicine beyond its frontiers. I have a question for Allie. Allie, how did your nursing background affect your patient experience? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, I think in the beginning when I first found out before we did, my husband and I did all the research and talked to all the doctors, um, it hurt me. Uh, it hit me pretty hard. My husband's like, what? <laughs> um, but I... I think knowing what I know now, um, I, I'm a better nurse because of it, because I've been on the other side. Um, even just being a mom um, with my first daughter, going back after I had my first daughter, daughter um, I did have a pretty soft side going back, but even more now that being on the other side as the um, parent of the patient and not just the nurse taking care of the patient. The patient. Um, but I'm thankful for my nursing background, um, but it definitely did hurt me in the beginning. <laughs> what area do you work in at UPMC? Um, I, prior to my surgery with Emory, I was a full-time uh, pediatric ICU nurse. Now I'm just a casual employee. Um, COVID's kind of kept me a little bit from being able to go back to work um, just because of the low patient census. Um, but at this point, uh, I have I love the pediatric ICU. You see so many different things um, in and out of their wide range of patients um, age-wise, as well as um, the different services and things like that that we work through or work with throughout the hospital. Um, and kids are resilient. They really are. They overcome more than I think you would ever think an adult could. That's wonderful. Thank you, Allie. Uh, a question for, for Dr. Green. Dr. Green, um, how uh, I'm a supporter of the Department of Neurosurgery. How do do donations help support the work being done at Children's? Uh, well, donations help us with uh, clinical research projects that there isn't funding for. Donations help us publicize our research by um, enabling us to attend meetings and give presentations. Um, donations can be used to specifically help patients separate from funding research at UPMC. Great, thank you. Um, I want to thank uh, Dr. Green. I want to thank Allie, um, your beautiful children for being on with us today. Uh, such an incredible presentation. Um, so inspiring. 
Dr. Freelander, I'd like to throw it back to you to uh, end us for the day. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, I want to uh, thank you all. And I had a, uh, also a question uh, for Dr. Green myself. Uh, you know, the, the neurosurgical career, a medical career, but neurosurgical career is is uh, is grueling, uh, both the training and and afterwards. But there are some special considerations for females in neurosurgery. We uh, uh, we wish we had uh, even more faculty members. But members, but you're a role model. Can you talk a little bit about uh, your your experiences? Uh, sure, thank you. Um, I don't think of myself as a role model too often. Uh, I think that a lot of women are scared off from neurosurgery because of the length of training. They think um, they won't be able to have a personal life and uh, be a neurosurgeon. And I think I can say that's not true. Um, I'm married, I have three children, um, so I, I succeeded in that. Um, I think if you do what you love, the rest will follow. If it's important to you to have children, you'll have children. If it's important to you to be a neurosurgeon, you should do that. I think if you have a career that you love, you spend as much time at work as, as you do at home or more, and having a career that you love at least makes me a, a better parent and spouse. All right. Well, uh, thank you, and uh, you you are a role model. So, <laughs> anyway, want to thank uh, you, Dr. Green, Ali. Thank you as well, uh, you and the uh, beautiful kids, uh, for uh, for being part of uh, uh, this. Uh, I'm uh, incredibly proud of all the work that's been uh, done, as well as the work being done in general in our department. That's what we strive uh, for: to do things uh, better every day uh, for every patient, one patient. Uh, at a time. So again, thank you again for uh, next uh, week. Uh, we're going to have Dr. Michael Lang uh, join us. Uh, Dr. Lang's been with our department uh, for a little over a year now. Uh, uh, again, he does uh, vascular neurosurgery in adults, but one of the very special things that he does, he also does endovascular work, uh, minimally invasive uh, techniques to um, uh, treat uh, blood vessel problems. He also does uh, some uh, very technically challenging revascularization. So look forward uh, to seeing uh, Dr. Lang uh, next week. Uh, I wish you all a safe and happy uh, weekend and uh, week ahead, and uh, we'll see you in a few days. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Thanks, Ellie.